Thank you for the invitation, and it's nice to speak about something that is not exactly what puts food on my table, right? These are all side projects that I do for fun. Uh, and the title today is, of course, a reference to uh, Romeo and Juliet, right? Which is, if you think, it's really like a tragedy about like teenagers that have the wrong last name. Uh, uh, and in the second act, uh, Juliet says to Romeo, what's in a name that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And having mentioned names and roses, we should have a quote from the name of the rose. And this is, in fact, the last sentence in the book that says of the primeval, of the pristine, like, primitive rose, just the, just the name remains. And all we have are bare names, which is very fitting because today the goal of this talk is to show that a lot of information is, hide, is hidden in a list of bare names. And so we're going to take a look at two different lists of names. In the first part, I'm going to analyze last names of professors in different uh, academic environments in three different countries. And this is work that I published with my uh, former postdoc, Jacopo Grilli, who actually this week started like, his new position at the Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste. And, and then the second, we're going to switch gears, and it's work in progress with Daniel Miner, that is now at ETH, but today actually is here, over there. Uh, uh, so like this, I would really welcome any feedback you might have, because this is really like developing as we speak. Before I get into like the, the, the research, like just a few concepts about names. Uh, and I'm going to take the case of Italy, because we're going to see later Italian last names. Uh, so in Italy, like, uh, last names are inherited from your father. Uh, women keep their maiden name, right, contrary to some other uh, countries. And therefore, like, father, son, father, daughter, and siblings have the same last name. If you're an ecologist or an evolutionary biologist, when you think of last names, you're thinking of neutral alleles, right? These are just passively passed down from generation to generation. And as such, they would be described very well by what we call the neutral theory uh, of evolution. This is, Italy is actually a great example of this because the, Italy is basically the tropical rainforest of last names, right? You know that like uh, in the Amazon there's 10,000 species of trees and Italy is the equivalent for last names. And this is because Italy was like divided in very, very ma many small, small countries and each one had its, its own dialect. And therefore like the same name comes with very many different spellings, right? So, so if you think of the US, Smith is the most common last name. It's, it's like referring to blacksmith, and it's about 1% of the population in the US. In Italy, Ferri, Ferraro, Ferrero, Ferrari, Ferruzzo, et cetera, would be all Smith, right? But they're all different, and they're very regional, right? So if we look in, the Asia, in, in Asia, like in Vietnam is the record, like 10 names cover 83% of the population. Right? If you go to the US, the top 10 is like about 5%, and the top 50 is about 12%. In Italy, the top 10 cover only 0.67% of the population, and the top 100, last name, only 2.5% of the population. So they're incredibly like, fine scale last names that are also geographically very well defined. So this is my last names. There's about 20 million families in Italy. And this is taken from the phone book. So 54 families in Italy have my same last name out of 20 million. And you can actually see that my last name was originated in this area between Piedmont and, and, and Lombardy. And then some people moved south. So this one here is my dad. <laughs> I'm not the first person to say this. And in fact, there's a whole idea of studying like, last names as genetic markers before the advent of cheap genetic markers. So, so in 1987, Cavalli, Sforza, and other people published this study trying to grasp like, human migration using last names as genetic markers. And by the way, this Antonio Moroni is another phenomenal character. This is like a, it was a Catholic, a Catholic priest and the grandfather of ecology in Italy, and he's the person that taught me very poorly ecology. Very poorly because I didn't learn much, not because he was a bad teacher. Uh, and uh, so like, having said this about last names, we can get into like, the data that I'm going to use. Uh, and so these are just like lists of uh, very many professors. right? Uh, and in Italy, it's very, we're very lucky that the Ministry of Education publishes every year a list of all the professors in Italy, along with their disciplines and the institution where they work. And so like we just took several years, five years apart from 2000 to 2015, 
each one of these lists comprises between 50 and 70,000 uh, faculty, right, depending on the year. And then to try to match these to other uh, countries, we looked at France. So in France, we basically got the, uh, um, the list of all the people that are affiliated with the CNRS, the National Center for Research. This could either be employed by CNRS or employed by universities but affiliated with the laboratory in the CNRS. And so this is about like 45,000 uh, researchers. This is interesting because for women, we have a self-reported maiden name, right? So for some women, we have both their married name and their maiden names, and we're going to use them later. For the US, it's difficult because there's no such list. But if you're in a public institution, your salary gets published in many states. So we scraped all the data that we could on public institutions that have like, salaries online, and we just took the, the, the last names. And in this way, we built like 36,000 uh, last names of professors at the research institutions in the US. So like the data looks something like this. This is for Italy 2000, right? So we will have a first name that I just put like a code for privacy, a last name. Again, like this is just a unique identifier of the last name, the gender, the rank, the institution ID, which would be the university you work for, which is in a certain city, which is in a certain region, and that and you belong to a certain sector, right? In Italy, these are self-reported. In the CNRS, we looked at the laboratory you belong to. For the US, we actually match you with publications in Scopus to determine which discipline did you belong to. And the full data set for all the things that I'm going to say, it's available on GitHub here. Okay, so we have all these people with all these last names, and what we're going to do is to do something very simple. We're going to count edges in a network. So basically what we do is we take a city, or an institution actually, so this is the University of Bari, then we take a discipline, in this case economics, and then we put like nodes are people. So there's 139 people, there were at this time, 139 people working in economics in Bari, and these are the nodes of my network, and now I'm going to connect any two nodes that share the same last name. So I'm building like small clicks, right? It could be a pair, or here we have a triplet. So three people with the same last name. Here we have a quadruplet. And here we have a big cluster of six uh, people with the same last name, OK? These are called technically isonymous pairs. I did not invent this term, but you can imagine. It's just the number of edges in this network. And why do we choose this metric? Because it scales very well with size. So if I take like all the people, for example, in Sardinia in 2000, all the university professors in Sardinia in 2000, and I take a subsample right, of 500, 1,000, or 1,500 people, and I count the number of edges, you can see that these scale basically like the binomial coefficient, as they should, times a constant. So, so like I can track the mean very, very nicely. And they have very, very small variation around this mean, which is good, because that gives me a lot of statistical power. Alternative measures that I used in the past, actually, one would be, for example, the number of unique names in this set. But as you can see, it has a slight non-linearity. It's by and large linear, but not precisely, while this tracks exactly like the binomial coefficient. So we chose this metric out of like, statistical convenience. And, and so we can take all these edges and count them. And we can count them, for example, by region or count them by department, right? So I'm going to show you like counting these, these pairs by discipline, especially. But we get a number, you know, there's like 625 pairs. What does that mean? That doesn't mean anything per se, right? So we need to contrast this with what should we expect? How many pairs uh, we, we should observe in this, in this network? And so we decided just to use this very simplest approach, which is to randomize the data. But we're going to do something slightly more sophisticated in the sense that we're going to do three different randomizations. And so imagine that I have the computer science department at the University of Chicago, and I count the number of uh, pairs of people with last name that match. Then I could just like scramble all of the faculty in the US and build a new uh, computer science department at the University of Chicago and count again. This is what I call my randomization by nation. Right? In Italy, I showed you before that last names cluster geographically. Right? So, so there could be like that uh, there's typical Chicago and last names, which is not the case. But if you were, say, in Florence, it would be the case, right? that maybe you have like, the names that are from that area. So what I could do is like, I build the computer science department at the University of Chicago, but only taking people that are already in Chicago, maybe in another discipline, maybe in another institution, and then I count my names. So this is what I call the randomization by city. 
And just for completeness, and we will see later that this kind of yields some interesting insights, I could just do this by field. So I built the computer science department at the University of Chicago by taking other computer scientists from other uh, cities and just put them together. Right? So we will have these three different randomizations. <clears throat> and then we can have like an observed value, an expected value, and in fact, we can do this a million times, get a, a distribution for the expected value, and then we can see whether this is different, significantly different statistically from what we observed. And, and so I'm going to show you a bunch of plots that all look like this. So on the y-axis, we have like, the number of pairs that we observed by discipline, in this case, by this is geology and geophysical sciences, divided by the expectation. So like, if this matched exactly the expectation, we would have like, one, which is this bar, which is this line here. And then like a different bar for each of, of the three randomizations. So you can see in Italy, we will see a lot of this kind of U-shaped pattern in which when we randomize by nation, we have a large excess of pairs, right? There's a scarcity of uh, last names within departments or an excess of pair of name sharing. But when we account for the fact that these are geographically distributed, this bar goes down a lot, and in fact, I put a light color, meaning this is not significantly different from what expected once I ran a p-value and a Bonferroni corrected because I'm gonna you know, go through a number of disciplines. And then when we go by field, it comes up again at about the same height, meaning that there's no real clustering uh, of last names by field, or equivalently that fields are kind of uni uniformly geographically spread. Right? So, so we can do this for all the different disciplines, and what we see is a picture like this in which we always observe this U-shaped pattern. But in some cases, even accounting for the city, we still have an excess of name sharing. And we're going to get to that in a moment. The one thing that is interesting about this U-shaped pattern is it tells you that people tend to work where they were raised and born, right? Born and raised. So, 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 so the, this kind of signals a lack of mobility of Italian researchers, right? You tend to just diffuse locally where, where you were born. Okay, so, so you can do the same thing, of course, by instead of clustering by, uh, by discipline, you could cluster by region. So you can see that this kind of excess tends to be mostly in the south uh, once we account for geography. But now I just want to show you that this approach actually tells us something intelligent. Uh, and so if we look at France, Right? We, we see the same kind of U-shaped pattern, but you can see that the numbers are much smaller, so there's less clustering, and this is due to the fact that in France there's like the Ile de Paris, the area around Paris attracts a lot of research. Right? So a lot of what's going on is going on in Paris, and that's why we have less of a signal of uh, uh, geography, but by and large we have the same U-shaped pattern. And as you can see, in France there's nothing going on. Like once we account for geography, all these bars are light blue, meaning they're not significantly different from what I would expect. And this is when I use for women their maiden names, right? But now I can repeat the same exact calculation by using their married names, right? So now two people that are married have the same last name. And of course, all of the disciplines now become significantly enriched in name sharing because if you're married to a researcher, it's very likely that they will work with you in the same department, right? So, so, so this just to show that this is like very few people that have a married name and a maiden name in the set, but it's sufficient to sway all these results to become highly significant. Now, if we look at the US, what we find is something very different, right? First, we don't have as much as the U-shaped pattern that I was telling you before, because people are first very geographically uh, uniform, like the distribution of last names. And second, people move a lot, right? So, so, so that you, it's in fact like typical or canonical to do your PhD somewhere else and go work somewhere else, right? The most interesting feature about the US, however, happens in mathematics, in physics, and to some extent, I think also in some other disciplines, for example, chemistry here, right? That we have this kind of decline going from red to green, right? pedagogy and psychology, right? So, so if before I told you that when I account for geography, the, in Italy, like this goes away, it means that there are typical names of a certain region, this would tell me that there are certain names that are typical of physicists or typical of mathematicians. So, so what would be the typical name of a mathematician or of a, of a physicist, right? So, so that's a good question. 
Uh, and it turns out that it's last names that come from Asia are like the typical names of mathematicians and physicists. Right? So if you look at Zhang, which is the most common last name in chemistry and mathematics, it's the third most common in agriculture, geology, and physics. But if we go to the humanities, social sciences, and medicine, it drops like to the 41st first, uh, place in, uh, in sociology uh, and below 100 in the humanities. Right? Smith, which as I told you, is the most common last name in the US, is among the top three last names in the humanities, in sociology, and medicine. But then when we go to the, like, the sciences, it goes down. So that it's the 47th in geology, right? So, so this kind of uh, pattern that I showed you where these declines when we account for fields signals either specific immigration to certain disciplines or the fact that people from a certain like, background tend to choose certain disciplines. Right. And so now we're getting back to Italy. And I showed you that there was an excess of name sharing even when we account for geography, even when we account for whatever we can. And, and so like being Italian, the, you know, in Italy there was a prime minister that said that to speak ill of people, or to think actually ill of people, you do commit a seat, but you're always right, right? So, so like the, 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 the first thing that comes to mind is nepotism. And I didn't come up with this myself. In fact, you can find these type of uh, articles in the news. Uh, if we look at in, in Bari, like exactly the same department that I showed you before, there was this famous Professor Massari that had his son Lanfranco Jr., his other son Gilberto, his other son Gian Siro, and five of his grandchildren working in the same department. Right? In, in, in Palermo, Milone, like his brother, his son, and his daughter. Very famous Luigi Frati, which we will encounter later. That was at the time like the president of University of Sapienza, his wife, daughter, and then son. That was in a sort of a slightly different department, but now they're back together, fortunately, because otherwise, you know, distance. So, so is this nepotism or is it not? Right. So, so we can make hypotheses. If these were really nepotism, like what we envision is some like senior like professors that manages to hire their offspring, even though in Italy. These are like public competition across the whole nation. There's like a committee that is like uh, supposed to be choosing the best possible candidate for the position, and it's like super bureaucratic. But still, these things happen. So, so if these were to be nepotism, we would expect, for example, that the two people sharing the same last name, one of them would be a senior scientist, and the other one would be younger, probably, right? So, so we can look at ranks and see, is there an excess of full professor, assistant professor, a, a, a pair with name sharing with, with respect to what we would expect by chance. <coughs> Similarly, because names are inherited from your father but not your mother, we should observe an excess of male-male pairs with the same names. Retirees that are older will be more likely to share a, names with like people in the department than those that are already in the department. And more, most importantly, in 2010, like, there was a new law in Italy that forbade departments from hiring any relative of any of their faculty. Right? Because we have data after 2010, we can see whether we can see the effect of the law in the data. And I'm not going to bore you going through all these tests, but all of these things actually panned out. Right? So we always find exactly evidence in the direction that we expected. And so, like, this is, seems to be really nepotism, and I'm just plotting, like, these bars in time here. And you can see that it's kind of declining, with many disciplines showing this kind of pattern where, you know, in 2005 or 2010, it stopped being uh, significantly different from what we expected. And it's always the same disciplines that show up in the analysis, and most likely are uh, disciplines where these uh, posts at the university bring you prestige, but also like money to some extent, right? So, so these are like all things where if you're a physician and you also have an appointment at the university, maybe you can, you know, make people pay more for, for, for your services. Uh, one thing is like, it's always been declining. It's going to decline again for the wrong reason. Like one of the main problems that uh, Italy is currently facing is like the decline of resources for the universities. 
and in fact, like in the last decade, they lost 10% of the faculty. So if we look at the number of faculty in time, they, they, they peaked in circa like 2005 and then declined quite dramatically. All right, now why don't we do the same thing with first names, right, instead of last names? Importantly, contrary to like the neutral alleles that are last names that you just pass on without having a choice, you can choose the first name of your children. Right? And so as such, these first names possess a fitness. Right? They, they can change quite dramatically in abundance, in time, maybe attached to specific events. Right? So, so just to give you a glimpse of this, I took like, data from like, the Social Security Administration as a fantastic database where you can find all the names that were given to at least five Americans from the 1850s to today. And if you look at this data, you can find fantastic patterns. For example, the name Elvis, Right? You can see that it has two peaks. This is the debut of Elvis Presley, the death of Elvis Presley. Right? So you can really pinpoint. If you look at uh, Gwyneth, like, uh, that is not a name that is easy to pronounce, at least for me. When uh, like Gwyneth Paltrow started like, her career, you can see a dramatic increase in the frequency. If you look at Osama, after 9-11, it dropped basically to zero. If we look at Hermione, you know, that was not a name until very recently, and in fact, until the first HP movie, right? Not the books, mind you. Like, that tells you about how do you choose the names for your children. And Khaleesi, which is like an invented name, you know, also like starts appearing. So, so one day you will be, you know, at Medici and it would be Khaleesi party of four. You know, and this is really like winter is coming, right? That the people are choosing these names for their children. All right, so if we go back to, to Italy and we look at the distribution of first names, first we see like, that there's not much geographic signal, right? So the bar that is blue is not much smaller than the, the, than the red, and in fact, maybe there's like north-south divides on, last na on first names, but not much. But in many disciplines, you see the same pattern that we've seen in the US for, for last names, right? That the green bar, is smaller than the other two. In some cases, in civil engineering, it becomes non-significantly different once we account for the, the, the discipline. Industrial engineering is the same, and you can see medicine is similar, et cetera, et cetera. So that, if we use the same interpretation that we had before, it means that there's typical first names of engineers, typical first names of physicians, uh, people in agriculture, et cetera. So what would that be? Any guess? This is uh, a game. What is causing this pattern? Gender. Gender. In fact, if I plot the red bar against proportion of women in all this data, <laughs> we can see that it tracks uh, very, very well like uh, the, the gender representation. So this is because there's few women in engineering, etc., and therefore there's like less diversity of first names. All right, just to wrap up this part of the talk, so we took like a list of names of professors, and we saw that we very simple randomizations, we can probe like mobility of researchers in these different institutions. We can detect sp field-specific immigration or like cultural backgrounds. We can also like attempt analysis of nepotism, and we can highlight uh, gender imbalance. And I think I proved that uh, an Italian professor by any other last name would not smell as sweet. Right, so, yes? So you only draw a line if they're in the same department, right? Yes. Not, not, if, they're, not if they're in the same field. You could do this by field, by field. By, by, but then like, you would have the problem of geography, right? That, right. Uh, so, so that's why we first like, draw the lines within departments, and then we sum by field. So does it like, capture the effect of um, you know, people whose parents have PhDs are much more likely to get PhDs. Right. You know, there may maybe like the, there's no nepotism in that they're being hired in the same department, yes. but like, you know, if my father's a professor at U Chicago, I'm much more likely to be a professor yes. in a different department. Yeah, this is like what people call occupational following, or like you can think of transfer of social capital, right? So, so like uh, parents that are academics are more likely to, to produce offspring who are also academics. Now, because they're, they're academics. Do they have to be in your same department? I would not want my, my children in my same department. I don't know about you. But so, so that's like my argument against this, right? It's true like, that it's hard to see your children go away to like 
15 kilometers away another university, you should do that. That's, that's my opinion. But, 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 but sure. But and also, like, if you're a mathematician, can your children be string theorists? What is the difference? You know, like, so, so, so I feel that it is a, it's an argument that people made, but, but I don't buy it as much. All right, so let's switch gears and consider a completely different uh, list of names. And, and so this is a project that is in progress. And in fact, I'm seeking like funding for, for this to really scale this analysis up. And the idea would be to track academic attrition using as input a list of people that got a PhD. And we have a very good list of people that got PhDs. And I'm going to especially focus on the effect of gender, right? So, so we can try to gender the people that got their PhD and see whether different uh, uh, genders lead to different attrition in different disciplines. And, and so like the idea is to use these fantastic data sources. So in the US and Canada, you can get a list of all the people that ever got a PhD from ProQuest, where your thesis is deposited. And in this way, we got like 900,000 people from the US and 100,000 uh, fr from Canada. In the UK, there's a similar service run by the British Library that has 260,000 people. In Germany, France, and the Netherlands, there's not sh such a centralized service, but there is like a European repository where there's a, a bunch of people, not, not exactly all of them. But in general, from this, we can get like their first name or first names, last name, graduation year, which institution awarded your PhD, and sometimes the type of degree or the subject, and almost always the title, but I don't want to machine read all the titles and figure out whether this is a thesis about like a history of art or quantum physics. But so imagine that I have all these uh, uh, dissertations, right, and I can extract this data. Now, what, my idea is to match this data with publication record, right? As a scientist, whenever you publish a paper, you're like carrying a GPS tracker that pings like the database saying I'm still alive, still kicking, and I'm in this place at this time, right? So, so I can see that you're still productive, still productive, still productive, and at some point you stop publishing, right? And I take that to be an indication that you left uh, academic uh, research, right? And so you stop publishing. And, um, and to do this, I rely on Scopus, which is like a database of publication, and so like the main hurdle here is to match the people given their name and their institution with Scopus, right? Uh, so that's what I'm attempting to do. And then you can enrich this data by adding like a, a country specific like gender. Of course, it's not perfect, but you can get it uh, quite well. Uh, and then finally, you can analyze this data. And the way I'm going to analyze this data is really like from using basic methods from biostatistics. So imagine like that you go to the doctor and say, doctor, I have a terrible disease. I got a PhD in string theory from Harvard University. How many years do I have? You know, like, uh, uh, this is exactly like <laughs> what you will do. Uh, uh, so what we're going to do is like really survival analysis of people with a certain PhD. And just like a few notes on current methodology and population. So we only consider PhDs for 20 years from 1995, 30 years uh, from 1995 to 2015, 14. And then, of course, I can only match you if you publish the paper, right? Immediately before or immediately after your PhD, right? I'm not going to take you to be your paper if this was published in 1850, right? Because it cannot be you, right? So this is our control for, like, the quality. And this will be successful only in, like, STEM uh, disciplines where journal publications are most common. Of course, it would not work in the history of art where you maybe like just publish books, right? And also like I would have much more sparse data. The good news about using a Scopus is that it can search your affiliation history. So if I say you got a PhD from Oxford, you have to have a paper with like somebody with your same first and last names that has had a paper from Oxford, right? In about this year. So that's how I can narrow down and try to get good quality matches. One major hurdle that maybe we can discuss during the question time is that women can change their last name and then Scopus can lose track of them, right? So Scopus maintains a page for each author that has a number of papers, but eventually women will fall out of this unless they request like to be tracked with like two different names. You had a question, Mary? Is it hard to know what gender 
It's not that hard, like because as I showed you, like we have millions and millions of data points on, on like, uh, so I can assign anybody that has a probability 99.5% of being men to men, right? And, and, and they can gender about two thirds to three quarters <coughs> of the people that way. And you can use country specific databases. And there are actually more sophisticated ways to do this and I'm thinking about it, but I haven't done the code yet. All right, so I'm just going to present very preliminary data on only four countries, right? And this is still, oh, yeah, Eric, you had a question. Uh, how long after the last publication does it have to be before you kind of consider them dropped out? Right, so, so that, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, so, so what I'm going to do is like I'm going to take people and then, you know, see all their publication lists, right? Im imagine that I can take the first year that you published a paper, the latest year that you published a paper. So if this latest year was this year, last year, the year before, I consider you still active. If this was 10 years ago, you have left science. Right? So, so like this is how do we determine who is right censored, right? who is still alive and kicking in the database. And uh, you can do some sort of sensitivity of seeing how does that reflect. Anyway, so, so as I'm saying, this is still work in progress, but I'm going to show you just like some preliminary results on four countries. Uh, the, the best, of course, is the UK, where we had 260,000 people, and I can match about 106,000. And I will focus only on uh, eight STEM disciplines, like biology, chemistry, computer science, engineering, geology, mathematics, medicine, and physics. And, and so first, we're going to look at survival curves. So just to introduce this type of curves, all people start at the very top with 100% of the population that is active at year zero, the year that they got their PhD. And then every year, this will kind of uh, invariably decline, right? Because some people will leave the field. Uh, and so this is like stratified by discipline. And just to guide your eyes, one good quantity is like this vertical line that says, where is your 50% probability? So this is like the equivalent of your life expectancy, right? So if you're in chemistry, your life expectancy in the UK is about five years. Right? And if you're in medicine, your life expectancy is about 15 years. Right? So, so there's a huge spread between like, uh, of the attrition, right? you can imagine it's the opposite of survival, across the different disciplines. And then if we look at the UK versus France, you can see that France is the place to be. Right? Because most people you know, can continue. A career of 15 years after your PhD means basically that you're a tenured professor, right, by and large, or that you're still like, with a permanent position in the sciences. But you can see that the order of disciplines is, is very similar. Like the, the disciplines where there's better uh, job prospects outside of academia, for example, chemistry, computer science, engineering, uh, and physics to some extent have like shorter lifespans, right, because of this. And then if we look at Germany and the Netherlands, we find a similar in ordering of the disciplines, but you can see there's a huge spread, and typically medicine tends to be about at the top, depending on the country, and then like the more like STEM, like hard sciences, like at the bottom. But now that I introduced this curve, we can stratify people by gender, right? So if I look at biology, and biology is a field where there's a lot of women with PhDs. Here I report the numbers, for example, for, for the UK, we have 9,000 men that we're tracking and seven, uh, almost 8,000 women. The ratio is like 1.16 men per women. And what you can see here is that there's a huge differential attrition between men and women. In fact, like your life expectancy is seven years if you're a woman, 15 years if you're a man, right? So if you think of any other disease of any kind, this would be completely unacceptable, right? Like to have like twice as much. The, the, the life expectancy. And, and in France, you know, like the two cores are slightly closer, but you can still see, and attrition is slower, is smaller in both cases, but you can see that there's a huge difference between men and women. In Germany, it goes between three and seven years, and in the Netherlands, like women drop at 11, like the life expectancy, and, and men keep going, right? So in all these cases, you see like the ratio between men and women is about like one, one and a half, right? So, so these are, uh, fields where women are well represented. What is surprising about these results, and that's why I'm curious of extending this analysis like, to other countries and, and looking more, more deeply in the data, is that when I look at computer science, where in fact the ratio is like 4.6 women, 4.6 men for each woman, the attrition is basically identical between men and women, right? And if I look in computer science in France, 
where like we have uh, again like a male dominated field 5.2 uh, men per per woman or if we look in Germany 7.5 right uh, uh, and in the Netherlands 3.4 and you can see that the Netherlands where there's like the lowest ratio we have like more of a differential attrition and when we have like very male dominated fields we find the same attrition so so this is kind of the opposite of what they expected to find and so I find it very interesting. The, the causes, of course, like two come to mind that are obvious. One of them would be self-selection, right? Imagine that you want to enter a male-dominated field, you better be good, right? Like you just do it consciously, knowing that you really are, uh, belong to, to this discipline, even though it's hostile to, to your own gender. That's one. Another uh, obvious explanation is that these are very self-conscious disciplines, and there's plenty of special scholarship, initiatives, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to try to retain women in these sciences, right? And uh, the combination of these two, or one or the other, or some other explanation might uh, be responsible for this pattern. But this pattern is, is uh, kind of common like through all the disciplines that I've seen. So disciplines like computer science, where there's very uh, skewed gender representation or mathematics, have less of a differential attrition. Now, this is done by eyeballing these curves, and we will do some uh, reasonable statistics uh, on this. But like uh, fields where uh, there's about equality in gender representation tend to have more of a differential attrition, which I find quite interesting. <coughs> because we have the UK, we can ask whether there's an Oxbridge effect, right? Does it really pay off to be you know, studying at Oxford and Cambridge or, or not? So we can take like universities and look at this kind of worldwide university ranking. And so there's two that are in the top 10 in the UK that are Oxford and Cambridge here in, in orange. And then there's other that are in the top 100 and other that are above the top 100. And what you can see is that in mathematics, you have a huge differential attrition depending on whether you trained at Oxford or Cambridge or not, right? You would have a, a, about like two thirds probability of being in academia after 15 years if you were trained at Oxford and Cambridge versus less than 40% if you didn't, right? In geology, we have a similar effect, like where like your prestige of institution counts for a lot, but in other fields, we have no effects whatsoever. In fact, it could be mildly negative, like to have trained in computer science at Oxford and Cambridge. I don't know if anybody in the room uh, did that. I'm sorry for you, but, uh, but, but that's what the data shows, right? And so like we find a strong positive effect of having trained in these two universities in four disciplines, and we don't find a positive effect or even a mild negative effect in other four disciplines. Now, there are a number of studies in the literature that show differential productivity and impact between men and women. And they feel that like most of these studies are biased by some uh, small problems that have to do with the sampling of these people. For example, uh, uh, recently there was a paper where they took like in the Netherlands and they took people that applied for a special grant that was for senior scientists <laughs> and they got like 500 uh, people a and what they found is that there was a substantial difference between the number of publications of men and women, right? Men tend to publish like about 43% more, which is a lot more than women, right? But if it is true, and I think it is true that the number of women in any field has been growing steadily, Right? And you just take like uh, 500 like, uh, random like, uh, uh, senior scientists, women will be younger than men. And because like, your number of papers is a non-decreasing function of your age, unless you retract papers, then it's bound to be growing. Right? Uh, so, so then like, this effect could be due just to the fact that these people have different ages. Right? They've been in the business for a different amount of time. Similarly, Herman et al., like in 2018, they looked at real, about 4,000 researchers, of which only 10% were women, who had published in a top math journal, right? And then they looked at their publication in the same journals, right? So how many papers do you have in the top 10 uh, mathematical journals? And found that males are overrepresented in the uh, extreme, like, uh, uh, of, qu of quantity, right? Top 10 and top 1%. So here we would have exactly the same problem of the age, right? Because if you publish your first paper in the top mathematical journal because you're young versus you publish your end paper, you know, because you're old, of course, we would find a difference. Also, like I just showed you that there could be differential attrition. So if you publish your first top paper in mathematics and then you drop out of the picture, of course, you're not going to have as many, right? So, so this is another problem that one should control for. And also, if you have a distribution, like a new sample, like 10 times as many, of anything, you will find a higher maximum, a lower minimum, 
we, we, we know all about this. So, so that is another thing that should be controlled for. Right? So I think that this kind of data that I'm trying to put together really can be used to do a fair comparison between the, the, the genders. By considering only active researchers, we get rid of the problem of attrition, right? We only look at people that are still in the business. And then we can just like pair men and women who have received a PhD in the same field in the same year at the same institution, right? So we really can compare like for like. So if we start two points at the same, in the same space, do they diverge in time or not? And this would also give us equal sample size, right? That removes the problem of uh, sampling. And then we can use randomizations to just swap the genders and produce a new graph and see whether this is like significantly different from what we would expect by chance. And because we're considering people with very different ages, and I told you like the number of papers or number of citations is gonna grow with your age, we're only gonna look at ratios, like the typical man versus the typical woman. So for each two pair, I can take the ratio of the number of publications or the number of citations or things like that. And when you do this, for example, this is the UK, this is the number of paper, the ratio. So like the bottom like horizontal line is one, which would be they have the same mean or median in number of publications, right? If we take two pairs at random, and then the other like horizontal line is one and a half, which would be 50% more papers, right? Uh, 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 so you can see that I ordered the disciplines. Uh, you cannot really see it very well. But this is physics, mathematics, computer science, medicine, biology, chemistry, engineering, and geology. So in geology, uh, men tend to have about 50% more paper than, than women, while in physics, they tend to have about the same number of papers. And then if we look at the citations, so the total number of citations that you received, again, like the mean and median for physics are about one, and for geology, they're about one and a half. And you can see that the order of the disciplines is kind of almost the same. And then if we look at the number of citations per paper, then all the numbers are about one, right? So, so if we were just to look at the typical, say, number of citations per paper, we would not be able to distinguish between men and women at all. And then we do Germany, we find pretty much the same patterns with a slight difference maybe in the number of citations per paper, <coughs> and then France, the same. And so, so we have this generic pattern in which, yes, men tend on average like to publish a, a little more, and a little could be very close to one or up to 50% uh, more. The number of citations grows a little more slowly, and the number of citations per document is about the same between the two genders. And by using randomizations, what we can do is to see whether these differences from one are actually uh, significant from a statistical standpoint or they're not. So if we look, for example, at medicine in the UK, right? So this is in red, we have the observed uh, ratio between, say, number of publications or citations in this case, between men and women. And you can see this is a little bit above one. And our randomization would have this shape, which is fairly similar, but with a mean and median of exactly one. Ratio of citations per document, they look identical between the randomization and the observed, while the ratio of documents, you can see that is slightly shifted. And so we can build just like uh, take the mean or the median for each one of these randomization, build a distribution, and then we can compute a p-value. What is the probability that this is really different from what we would expect? And so you can see that the number of documents, in this case, it's like 20% more papers per, for, for men than women. It's actually not going to be happening at random. So, so there's some uh, significant difference there. While the number of citations per document is smack in the middle of one, and the number of citations maybe is like significant or not, depending on how big is your sample size. And then if we look at computer science, we find in this case that there's no basically difference between men and women in both like the number of papers, the number of citations, or the citations per paper. Which is kind of interesting because like if we look as a table, what we find is that the same areas where we had less differential attrition between men and women, they also display less difference between productivity and citation between men and women. So, so like it's kind of interesting that these are always fields that are brought as a you know, because they're male-dominated fields. They're brought as a, a, an example that women would have some sort of differential abilities uh, from, from men. And what we find is evidence is absolutely nothing in these fields. But in fields where we have like equal gender representation or close to equal gender representation, we find that men tend to publish a, a lot more papers. 
The last thing I, I'm going to mention before I wrap up is mobility, right? Like we, we can think that uh, uh, mobility can contribute quite a bit to academic careers and we're kind of traveling monks, uh, you know, like going around until we settle and we start our shop like somewhere. And one reason for this differential like productivity and attrition between men and women would be that women are burdened by other uh, uh, um, kind of societal demands that uh, <coughs> make it very difficult for them to move, for example, childcare. Right? So what we can look is like something very coarse, but then we're going to do this better. Is like what is the proportion of people that have moved away from their own home institution where they got their PhD in time? Right, so if you start from like recent times and you look at what is the proportion of people that are still working at the same institution where they got their PhD, this is quite high. But you can see that in first rate institutions such as like Oxford and Cambridge, this rapidly declines to a very small number. While in very isolated uh, institutions, for example, both of these are in Ulster, which is like the part of the UK that is in the island of Ireland, where there's like a Protestant enclave in a Catholic country. And you can see that most of them remain like very, very close to home. And so if we look at mobility of how many people are still in the same institution per five-year period divided by gender, right? So I have like red are female, green are male, and ungendered, the ones for which I don't know a gender are in blue. You can see that in certain fields, for example, biology, or to some extent chemistry, and especially in mathematics, uh, female uh, uh, tend to um, remain more at their own institution than men. So they have less mobility than men. While in other fields, this is not the case. Of course, this can be done a lot better if we can actually see where are you going, not only if, if you're staying or going. Uh, and so like, this is like, very preliminary, as I said. Uh, but, but we're working on improving like, this pipeline for, for matching, which is like, the, the core of this approach. And my hope is to yield about 50% of matches, right? And this is like, kind of a good estimate because we can only track people in STEM. These are typically like two-thirds of the PhDs are like, in the sciences. One-third is humanities or other things where they don't publish papers. And, and then I hope to get about 80% of those uh, matched. And of course, I want to process US and Canada. This thing is taking forever. Like US, I think my estimate is it will take me seven weeks to download the whole data set. And, um, and in terms of analysis, like we can plot maybe the hazard rate. Like what is the probability yearly, on a yearly basis that you leave your, P, like your academic career stratified by decade. We can see whether things are going better or, or not. If there are specific years, that are years of high attrition, for example, movement from like PhD to postdoc to second postdoc to professorship to tenure. And then we can look at geographic mobility. So we had just like a glimpse of that, like looking at the same institution, but we can actually see where do you come from? Where do you go? Is there an interplay between mobility and attrition? Are people that move a lot less likely to uh, abandon academia? And then we can do some sort of social mobility, right? Like, is there a mobility between the prestige of institutions? Can somebody, you know, from trained uh, uh, lesser university become a professor in a top US institution? And this is interesting because there was recently a study where they looked at professors in, in US institutions in several disciplines and look, where did they come from? So this would be the complementary analysis, right? I know where you're coming from and see where you go. And of course, this would lend itself very well to a network analysis, right? We can see which uh, universities, for example, are central to the movement of academics in different countries. So just to conclude, the idea is to pair this list of last names that come from PhD thesis repositories and publication to show that attrition varies dramatically between fields, between countries, and the gender affects attrition the, the least in male-dominated fields, which I find as I said, very puzzling. And then the, the relationship between productivity and gender should be re-examined by producing a fair comparison that is like robust from a statistical standpoint. And that citations per paper seem to be equal between genders. So like institutions like University of Chicago in the BSD, for example, when you go for tenure, you can only list your top five papers. These inherently would have less of a bias than counting the number of papers or counting the number of citations. And I showed you that women tend to be less mobile in certain disciplines, and this could have strong effects on career. And with this, I'm going to wrap up. There's two papers on nepotism, like one that actually 
uh, allowed me to make friends. These are my endorsements. Make friends with very important people I in Italy. Uh, and uh, this is like the second paper that I suggested. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Manuel. So I thought it, uh, it's interesting to see uh, liberalism in Italy. However, the observation are a little bit even more subtle. What you see is that the city, excess in the city, is lower than nation. Right? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. If I'm an Italian professor in Italy, I would say, oh, no, 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 our level is very low, even lower than average in the country. How do you argue for that yes. possible defense? Yes, like, so the, this study shows that academic system in Italy is bad. If I were to look at judges or other things, it would be probably worse. That I agree. But like, it's just that there's no good data to show that it's really worse. But, so you mean basically? This is the national level. Yeah, the national yeah, level is true for, for almost any profession, and especially when there are like public competitions for positions. It's, it's pretty bad. I have a question about computer science. So you noted, you noted that like in computer science you get less of a gender disparity, right? Right. Um, have you thought about check, using like some other data source, maybe like GitHub commits, or like GitHub histories, or things like that, to see if how much of attrition is happening? for people who move to industry in computer science? Because one possibility could be that a lot of the attrition that's, if most, because you said that computer science had one of the lower levels of people, the survival rate was lower, right? So right. the attrition is actually happening High. in like tech. Yes. And Yes, so Raoul's question is very good. Like one explanation for this would be that there are very good jobs outside academia, while this is not true in certain other fields, right? Which kind of, like uh, uh, you know, suggest a terrible strategy to remedy like the gender disparity in academia, which would be to lower everybody's salary dramatically, at least temporarily, right? Get gender equality and then raise them again, because at that point they're locked in, right? So, so, so I think that you you might be right, right? That, uh, careers where there's very good opportunities outside academia would see less of a of a gap because of that. Yes, that's a very good hypothesis. Yes. Um, can we talk a little bit about productivity? Your yes. measure of productivity. So I think that what you're showing is a measure of actual acceptance of papers, right. but that doesn't necessarily represent productivity as a construct. Oh, yeah. So unless you have the number of submissions. Yeah, yeah, but my productivity would be so much higher. You know, <laughs> if I were to count the number of submissions. No, I know, but, my but if you're trying to, but if what you're trying to measure is institutionalized discrimination, right. then we can't really say that yes. women aren't going to have a lower acceptance rate of their papers. Yes, like there so are it's studies. It's not really a representation of productivity. It's yes, a now this is like number of papers. Successful right. acceptance of papers. Yes. There are studies like where they try to look at rejection rate between yeah. different genders. Like I remember one in ecology because they had very good data, and there they didn't find uh, an, ex uh, an effect of that. That doesn't mean it's not true for uh, other fields. And unless you go in and look at the the makeup of the editorial boards and the peer yeah, reviewers yeah. and track the whole process, you can't really say that there's. Yeah, yeah. No, this is just like: is it true that men have bias? more published papers than yeah. women? That yeah, is, so this is the question. Just when you're talking about it, talking about publication bias as a potential limitation, I think is... Yeah, but it's interesting that, again, fields where we see less of a differential attrition, right. men and women have exactly the same number of papers. Which we would say that like, if it were something against only like against women generally, I would not be able to explain that. Or that there's some, some different level of discrimination in those fields than other fields. Or that is field specific. Yeah. Yeah. But, but these are the most male dominated fields where all the editorial board is going to be men. So, so that is kind of interesting because of that. So it's exactly the opposite of what I would have right. expected to be. Yeah, I, yeah I, just, I like bristle at the term productivity. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Productivity is because that's how they call it in the literature. Number yeah. of papers published. Yeah. You look like papers on archive or bio archive where there's no. No, no. No, no, no I, have, I haven't. Like, there, there could be some way to match because for these people, I can get their ORC ID, and so then I can. Query. Like, the bio archive or archive don't really have a good API, like, for, for asking this type of stuff, so you really have to scrape it. I think I totally applaud, you know, the the goal 
and I think it's fantastic to put this out there in the literature. Um, so I think it's just a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. Time for one more question, if anybody has one. All right, let's uh, thank you. Thank you.